The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and afternoon for everyone. I think we're um, actually, well, officially, maybe perhaps even in California, right after the afternoon uh, time point. So um, on behalf of Fight Colorectal Cancer, I'm Andy Dwyer in a joint appointment with the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Joining um, today with a very special guest, Dr. Axel Grothy from the Mayo Clinic, who's going to be talking about stage three and treatment options based on some fantastic data that's um, released in terms of thinking about informing uh, patient care. So we're really excited to have everyone join us today. Um, our webinar is going to now begin. A quick note um, that if you do have questions, thoughts, uh, the chat feature is open, so at the right side of your screen, you'll notice an opportunity to chat any questions that you might have, um, so Sharon can facilitate it today after today's um, content description and presentation from Dr. Grothy. So um, before we get started, I want to just do a special thanks to Michael Sola, um, who's helping with the web content as well as social media, and uh, Sharon um, who does a lot of the patient navigation uh, leadership amongst the team and manages the, the work. So um, big thank you to both of you and then also to our comm team who's uh, joining in the wings in terms of making uh, to provide good insight um, on Facebook and social media. So quick note as you're keying in questions and thoughts so we ask that you reserve um, specific questions to general. Uh, Dr. Grothy is not able to um, provide direct medical advice for individual patients at this time. But um, he's noted, as well as the rest of our team, um, that if you do need a medical attention or care, please visit an emergency room, your own doctor, um, as well as our experts, our treating physicians a lot of times, who are happy to work with patients in an individual one-on-one -on -one clinical relationship. Um, so after today's webinar, just a quick reminder that these will be archived um, at the fightcrc.org site. Um, the, today's webinar, as well as a repository of great information um, that we've uh, been able to offer are there for your liking. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and uh, move to the next slide. We are really thrilled to actually offer two fantastic resources that I think um, have become amongst the most popular for patients the fight CRC has to offer. Um, the newly formatted Guide in the Fight is now broken into three distinct booklets. Um, collect all three. Um, we've really tried to manage information with Sharon's leadership and the rest of the team really formatting that we're really thinking about early stage uh, treatment decisions, even all the way things to thinking about palliative care, um, business and financial and logistical measures, as well as thinking about your, uh, your uh, course through therapy. So the guide is really meant to help um, stage four, three, four um, patients really think navigate their journey um, through the cancer continuum. So great resources, download it today. In addition, um, working with Tom Mercillier, as well as uh, Fly Their Own Health, we're really interested in to tell you guys all about the new late stage trial finder that is housed on the Fight CRC website, where we're really focusing on the priority area of MSSS, MSS trials um, for colorectal cancer um, research. And so at this time, we have a really nice uh, supplement uh, database right now that's being um, implemented and that it's open for patient utilization on the Fight CRC website. So this is meant to complement a number of other resources that are available in terms of clinical trial finders, but specifically prioritizing towards the MSS trials um, that we think at this time will offer, will offer up some of the best opportunities uh, for particularly late stage colorectal cancer survivors. So super stoked about these resources. Um, check out our webpage. Okay, next slide. Um, as noted earlier, just a reminder that if you're needing direct medical care, speaking with your own provider or calling 911 is something that's um, definitely strongly advised. And just a quick reminder that Fight CRC is to provide general information to help you in your journey, but want to ensure that you do connect with your direct clinical team about your own specific situation. Next slide. So with that, I'm really excited to announced that Dr. Axel Grothy, who is with uh, Mayo Clinic, who heads um, a lot of the translational and clinical uh, leadership at Mayo, who's also a clinical provider and has done a number of fantastic things uh, with the National Cancer Institute, uh, contributing to the research, the literature base, as well as really helping individual patients seek care. Um, he's really one of our leading medical advisory board members um, through Fight CRC and her work, and we're really always excited to be able to 
work with him to understand a little more about the science in his work. As it's noted, he's been um, definitely mentioned and noted in his work in over 500 articles, books, um, and really contributing to some of the top leading research and journal, journal articles um, that are being put forth even today. So we're really excited to have Dr. Grothy give um, some great information about uh, stage three um, disease and some options. And we're going to have plenty of time for asking questions today. Um, so make sure and key any specific questions that you might have um, so Sharon can help facilitate that. So Dr. Grothy, I think with um, you, we are ready to move forward with, I think, which has been some of the most exciting and riveting information that's come forth in terms of thinking about uh, treatment decisions. So we'll punt to you. Okay, thank you very much for having me today. And uh, I just want to compliment Fight Correct cancer for all the work you're doing. I think it's very important to create awareness of, uh, you know, new advances in treatment, connecting patients uh, with research and providers and the network within amongst patients. And uh, I think this is, this really highlights the partnership we have from our end. And I look at myself as a clinical researcher, as someone who tries to move colorectal cancer therapy forward, but also someone who actually gives, you know, provides help to patients, individual patients. I'm an oncologist, 50% of my time is clinical time, so I interact with patients. <clears throat> so I hope I can still, it can relate to patients in, in some ways. Um, also, uh, people might know that I'm a member of a cancer family, so cancer is, has affected a lot of my family members. So this is a very important part of my motivation to improve outcomes for patients. So what I like to talk about, and uh, I do believe that this is one of the more important changes or let's say studies that have, will influence the way how we treat patients after surgery uh, when lymph nodes are involved. And this was presented quite uh, prominently in the plenary session at ASCO, this large meeting in Chicago once a year where 30,000 oncologists and healthcare providers, researchers, et cetera, come together and talk about latest advances. And of all the abstracts uh, that were submitted, all the diseases, this was abstract number one. And so this shows the importance that the scientific committee here really put forward. Um, and I hope that when uh, after we talk about this, you, you'll see why I believe that this is important. So this, as you can see from the many names, is an international collaboration, an international duration evaluation of adjuvant chemotherapy, three months versus six months. And let's go through to the next slide. And it might take some time for this to come up. So when we go back, you know, what is uh, what has been or had been the standard of care of adjuvant therapy? Um, in 1990, Dr. Mortel at Mayo Clinic found out in a pivotal study that, you know, when patients who had lymph node positive stage three cancer, colon cancer, went to sur after they went to surgery, when they continued some form of treatment, anti-tumor treatment in form of 5-FU therapy, which is one of the chemotherapy agents for 12 months, for 12 months, they did, their outcome was better than patients who had surgery alone. This was the beginning of adjuvant therapy, meaning post-operative treatment to improve outcomes for patients with stage three lymph node positive colon cancer. Now, we no one get treatment for 12 months anymore because somewhere in the mid 1990s, we ran studies comparing six months to 12 months. And admittedly, these studies were not, according to our current feeling well powered, they didn't include enough as enough patients that would like to see. But the feeling was that patients only needed six months of treatment and not 12 months of treatment, which of course it took off a lot of the treatment burden, costs, and side effects for patients. The next step that happened in 2004 was that a new drug came into the play, oxaliplatin. Oxaliplatin is an IV agent, which uh, those of you who've heard about it and you know, those of you who've been treated with it, has some issues in terms of nerve toxicity, neurotoxicity, cold sensitivities, it creates more nausea, creates more um, higher risk of infection, et cetera. Uh, but it did improve outcome when it was added to the standard six months of 5-FU therapy. And eventually the six months of Falfox, which is 5-FU, which is the IV drug, leucovorin and oxaplatin, uh, became standard of care, and we got used to putting ports and pumps in, you know, ports placement to allow for the infusion of 5-FU. Um, and so six months of this treatment was considered standard of care. 
Um, now, again, I mentioned that the problem is really this dose-dependent neurotoxicity. The longer we treat patients with oxaplatin, the more neurotoxicity and nerve damage will patients have, that tingling and pain, numbness in feet and, feet and hands. And one of the side effects that is, uh, one of the reasons why the side effects is cumbersome is because a lot of side effects that we inflict on patients with chemotherapy go away after we stop the treatment, like hair loss and diarrhea, et cetera. But a neurotoxicity, nerve damage can persist for the rest of patient's life. And sometimes I, I do believe we underestimate the severity of the nerve damage that we inflict on patients sometimes. Eventually, we don't even ask patients anymore because, you know, after three to four to five years, patients have all, also learned how to work around it. And it's not perceived as this pertinent information anymore. And I do believe that from our perspective as providers, we underestimate the severity. Now, shorter duration of treatment would be great if we can show that this comes without compromising the what we're actually trying to do, meaning curing patients, meaning delaying or the preventing tumor recurrence, tumor, uh, tumor from coming back. So if we could show that three months is as good as six months, we would save side effects, would save expenditure, you know, would be less interfering with patients' lives, et cetera. Next slide. So in order to answer that, we really had to get together as an international group because we needed a lot of patients, because we need to be very sure that when we reduce the number of treatment cycles, reduce the amount of chemotherapy, that we're not harming patients by not treating enough because everyone wants to you know give me what you can because i want to cure this cancer but the question is do we really need to go beyond a certain point so in order to um, really provide solid data we really needed more than 10,500 patients eventually we had 12,834 patients in a collaboration around the world six different trials were prospectively initiated that all had the same question three versus six months of treatment. And they had, they actually, we had a contract with each of these studies group that they were not allowed to present or publish their data before the, all the group had uh, presented their data. And the data analysis was conducted at Mayo Clinic. So we collected all the information from all individual patients in all these 12 different countries around the world. The next slide shows you um, a world map where this trial was really conducted. So you can really see it is a worldwide effort. So the next slide, please. Um, you see the, all the green countries here are where these studies were conducted. And this actually, it's really by far the largest collaboration ever in the, in the assessment of colorectal cancer in the history of this disease uh, when it comes to treatment intervention. Next slide. So the principle is really, and again to highlight, we're trying to balance lower side effect, lower toxicity, and is, does that mean with a shorter duration, is there a higher risk of recurrence? And the question then, of course, is when we save toxicity, is there any difference that's acceptable for us to, let's say, there might be a slightly higher risk of recurrence? And this is really the question that a non inferiority study, this study, needed to answer. So let me say, try to simplify that a little bit. Next slide. Um, so when we look at 100 patients with stage three colon cancer, these are all these patients that are there. Next slide. Um, 60 of them will be cured with surgery alone. We don't even need any further treatment. The problem is we don't know who these patients are. We don't know who these patients are. Next slide. Um, though they don't need chemotherapy. Next slide. So then there are these about 20 patients that, uh, or 25 patients that recur in spite of surgery and chemotherapy. In those patients, next slide, chemotherapy didn't help, at least not enough, because these patients still have recurrence of their disease. So this small, the group of patients that gets cured because they got adjuvant therapy is this small number of patients that you can see here, which is about 15%, 15 of 100, uh, who just get cured with uh, 5-FU or fluoroprimidine. The next click is the addition of oxaliplatin gives us another about seven to eight patients that 
get cured because of the addition of this drug that has the most side effects. So that's the dilemma right now, and that's overall probably uh, the problem that we um, cannot identify upfront who are these patients who benefit, who are these patients who don't benefit, who are the patients who benefit from the five of you component, who are the patients who benefit from oxalitazine. That's really something we don't uh, understand, we don't know yet. And we're treating with oxaliplatin. 100% of patients to get these seven patients that are outlined here in green to really benefit. Um, next click. Okay, so you see that only the ones that benefit from chemotherapy are the ones that are highlighted right now. Next click. All patients that we treat get side effects from the chemotherapy. And now the question is, is it reasonable? Can we reduce the number of treatment cycles, thereby reduce the the the, the side effect, burdens of therapy, costs for all patients when we, when we know that only a fraction of patients actually benefit. Next slide. So the study overview, again, was um, patients in the individual trials were randomized to three months or six months, and uh, 12,834 patients were randomized. The investigators in these countries could choose, based on the protocol, Falfox or Capox. Let me give you a little bit of background on that. Falfox is the most commonly used regimen here in the United States. It's this pump-based port placement requirement infusion of 5-FU, which is you carry the pump around for two days every two weeks, get oxaplatin on day one, um, and this repeats itself every two weeks. Capox is an, a treatment where we use an oral agent, capsaibin or zeloda, which is a substitute for 5-FU. So for those patients who get KPOX, we do not need a port, we do not need a pump. It's a different schedule. It's a three-weekly regimen. So 12 cycles of Falfox equal eight cycles of KPOX, meaning for 12 IVs of oxalplatin equals eight IVs of oxalplatin and KPOX because the dose of oxalplatin is high. Why is that important? Because we see some differences in outcome in patients, and I'll show you that in a minute, between KPOX and FOLFOX. I have to tell you that in countries where, um, uh, let's say, the cost for a society uh, really dictates uh, what uh, treatments regimens are being used, KPOX is preferred because there's no port placement, no surgery, no surgery to place it, no surgery to take off no pump treatment, no reduced nursing time, because um, you and you take the chemotherapy at home. Um, in the United States, the co-payment for capsaibin for Zeloda can be an issue sometimes, and availability of Zeloda, uh, capsaibin. But in the end, you know, again, worldwide, there's about a 40% of patients that receive KPOX, 60% get POFOX. So I don't want to get into the specifics of this non-inferiority design that's outlined on the right side. We can talk about this later what that actually means, just to highlight for this statistical purpose what you need to see, and again, if you have questions, I'd be more than happy to talk about this. The trial was considered positive for the overall patient population, so all the patients, 12,800 patients combined, if the upper limit of this hazard ratio, and again, just a statistical term, did not exceed 1.12. Keep that in mind, 1.12. Next slide. So first of all, when we talk about outcomes, what we try to really do is decrease toxicity. And when you look at three months versus six months, whether you looked at patients receiving Falfox or Capox, the oral agent, Capsidin plus Oxaplatin, the neurotoxicity, grade two plus, meaning that's the toxicity we consider uh, clinically meaningful, was much less when lower dura shorter duration of treatment was used, three months versus six months. Interestingly, the Scott trial, the UK trial, which contributed patients to the study, also um, looked at, um, and that's on the next slide, I think, um, they looked at long-term outcomes. And uh, so when you go to the next slide, you actually see to the right side, five years after the start of therapy, what the neuropathy questionnaire uh, difference was between the bars with in, in, in blue, three months of treatment versus six months of treatment. And you can see, however the questionnaire was structured, that 
the score that patients had that had three months of therapy for neuro for persistent neurotoxicity was much lower than for six months of neurotoxicity. So this effect preventing nerve damage is still long lasting even after five years. And this is exactly what our perception is that patients really get harmed longer term from longer duration of therapy. Now, what's the trade-off? And that is the next slide here. That is really the comparison between three months and six months. How much are we losing here? And the, so what's plotted here is a so-called Kaplan-Meier curve. It's kind of a disease-free survival curve. It's the curve that looks at the percentage of patients that do not have tumor recurrence and are still alive between three months in, in white and six months in red. And you can see this is the, it spans over six years. The most reliable data we have just from the timing of the study is for at, at, up to three years. And you can see that three months and six months are very, very close. The three months curve is steps a little bit below the, the six months curve. Um, the three year disease free survival absolute difference of, for all patients is point nine percent so less than a percent of patients this is not overall survival this is not death this is disease-free survival in the difference like that never has never translated into a difference in overall survival so that is really what we're talking about we have a lot less side effects with three months of treatment and the difference in kind of the potential loss in in for patients is less than one patient in 100, and we don't know who this patient will be, has a, has a, might have a disease recurrence at three years, more with three months compared to six months, one, less than 1%. Unfortunately, you know, and this is the discussion that was generated at ASCO, and there's probably a discussion that you might have seen if you follow the uh, literature and uh, the special press releases, the study was did not meet our pre-specified, very ambitious hazard ratio upper margin with this 1.12, because here it's 1.15. And that is um, the, the problem that this study was considered not positive for non-inferiority based on statistical concerns. But if I look at it from a clinical perspective, from a clinical point of view, there's really no big difference between three months and six months of therapy. Next slide. Now, this is the slide where Nancy Roach normally moans and groans, and I can hear her on this on the phone kind of in the background. But I just want to highlight another point that allow what we, what we allow to do. A lot of numbers here, but let me break it down for you. If, when, since we had 12,800 patients, the largest ever study conducted in the, this setting, actually more than twice as many patients as all patients combined so far, we were actually allowed, we could do a lot of analysis, including figuring out which patients are actually at low risk, which patients are at higher risk for recurrence. Because that can actually tell us who should treat, be treated longer when you have a higher risk, or who should be, can get away with shorter duration therapy. And it was very clear there are two different groups of patients, which came out very, very closely, and actually is something that we now use to design the next generation of clinical. First of all, the subgroup on the, uh, the low risk patients, 60% of patients have a low risk cancer identified by this tumor stage T and N, T13 N1. And if you look at the three year disease rate survival, meaning their chance to have no tumor recurrence and be alive for three years is very good, 83%, 83.1 and 83.3. So there's absolutely no big difference between three months and six months. Uh, really 0.2% is in the mar is in the kind of margin of error that we see in these studies anyway. So we feel as a group very comfortable that patients who have these low risk cancers who have very good prognosis, who have very reassuring outcome, they do not need more than three months of treatment. The higher risk tumors below that, you can see that there is, they don't do as well. And that's something that actually struck me as something which I hadn't fully realized that all these patients, T4, or and or N2 patients where more lymph nodes involved, the tumor is more aggressive overall, that those patients, number one, don't do as well. And they might need more treatment, even if even if you look at the absolute difference here in three-year disease-free survival, it's only 1.7%. Um, 
the surprise finding here, and this is something we're still discussing that's in the bottom part of the slide, is that this oral agent, Kpox, okay, the oral treatment, Kipsiden oxaplatin with the IV oxaplatin every three weeks, three months seem to be doing great, independent of stage, high risk and low risk stage. Now, KPOX is not commonly used in the United States. I said it's very commonly used out elsewhere in the UK, in Italy, in Japan, etc. cetera. Um, and it is um, really associated with poor IV administration if you just use three months of treatment and pill treatment at home, no port, no pump. Um, it's from what I, we know a little bit more toxic with more diarrhea and hand foot syndrome. So it's not as easy as false ox. But if we can get away with shorter duration, just 12 weeks of treatment, then everything's done. That's something I would like to talk to my patients about at least as a treatment option. Now, the next slide hopefully makes it a little bit clearer and summarizes this more, our final recommendation, which will hopefully make inroads into guidelines. For the low risk group that I mentioned, the T13N1, this is the low risk group. 60% of our patients are like that. That's the more common patients. We recommend the whole group that of the 12 countries and 20 in different investigators and seven statisticians, et cetera, all looked at the data. And we would recommend three months is enough. Whether you use whatever treatment you use, Falfox or Kpox, doesn't matter. You do not, you do not gain more from um, more treatment, no more benefit from more treatment. You have more side effects, which is a given. For high risk, for patients with high risk tumors, this is the bottom part here, you know, at three months, I think patients and physicians, oncologists need to engage in the discussion. This is where patients might stand up and say, you know, so let me ask you, I already have these uh, side effects here. My nerve, uh, I see some tingling, the cold sensitivity lasts longer, you know, I have a little bit nauseous, you know, we had to delay treatment for one already, one around already. How much would I lose now if we stop treatment here? Um, can you explain that to me? And now oncologists have data. We can say, oh, you one if you don't continue treatment, one out of 100 patients might have a tumor recurrence within three years, more than if we continued the treatment. Um, so that is there's a discussion point that I like to see in these high-risk tumors in, in patients who go through therapy. So um, and, and that is an important change in our standard of care because a lot of times I see that when, you know, adjuvant therapy goes through your 12 rounds of Falfox, you know, patients are, and don't, don't get me wrong, on autopilot more or less, oh, this is what we're going to do, 12, six months of treatment, then we're going to stop. There should be a discussion point in the middle where patients ask their doctor, so what am I losing if I stop now? I'm already kind of a little bit beat up by this. And the decision could be individualized could be based on age, you know, patients want, um, how high the risk was, you know, initially with the tumor presentation, what the side effects have been with the treatment. It's, you know, there are various ways how to go forward. Could be based on are we using a CAPEOX regimen, so the oral agent, or are we using FOFOX, because CAPEOX, again, trends a little bit better and probably, you know, more conducive to using shorter duration of therapy. All these factors can uh, be part of this. And I would think, you know, the, the change in our standard approach would really be if patients and physicians engage in the discussion halfway through the planned six months of therapy for the higher risk tumors, you can really see um, is it worthwhile continuing treatment or not. For the low risk tumors, again, 60% of patients, I feel very strongly, and this is what we've discussed here within Mayo Clinic, we've changed our standard of care we are only recommending three months of treatment for the sake of the patients because there's really no compromise in terms of decreased uh, anti-tumor activity for patients. Um, I think with that, I'll close. There is a, I think I'd like to come to the very last slide. Next, next slide here. Next slide. Okay. So what I really believe is important, and this ties into probably also the mission of fight colorectal so this is really an academic collaboration that was run for more than a decade. People invested a lot of time and resources because you can easily see that there was no pharma funding around. Which company would be interested in shorting the duration of treatment? This was could only be done with non-commercial funding, 
federal funds, public funds, philanthropy, um, and a lot of volunteering work, you know, from a lot of people involved. Um, and this highlights, I think, the need for, a, let's say, commercial interest independent cancer research agenda, which in the United States is really more or less NIH slash NCI funding. And I believe, you know, this study is a great example why we need uh, to support federally funded cancer research because it has can have immediate impact on patient care. Um, with that, I'll close and I'll be more than happy to take questions. Um, Dr. Grothy, this is um, Andy from FICRC, and I just want to say I think um, the information that you presented was fantastic. Um, as you noted, probably one of the most provocative um, findings at ASCO. And I guess, you know, to the point, I really love the, um, the note that you mentioned around research advocacy driving um, the research agenda and really helping to make sure that we find neutral opportunity to do that. And I, I know Nancy Roach, um, with so much of her work that's helped really lead Fight CRC, you know, that's something that we're continuing to work towards and spearhead. And so I think with your, um, you know, presentation of this, it's fantastic. And I, I really like that as a closeout. Um, I did want to note also, I don't know if others in the early slides saw Dr. Dan Sargent, who was one of the biostatisticians who was a Fight CRC board member. Um, and so I think in terms of one of the visionaries in this work, um, his Correct. opportunity to really think about data and to be able to design and help investigators design clinical trials. Um, it's just extraordinary to see this kind of work together. And so Dan passed away in the last year, but we want to really honor him for all of his great and fantastic work in this field. But, you know, Dr. Grothy, one of the things that um, as we're coming out of ASCO and seeing people really thinking about this trial, one of the things that I think that you're hearing more of is that as we really show the data for the three month, the six month, um, and then what this means for decision making, and as we really take into consideration side effects, as well as ultimately thinking about, you know, the type of treatment, um, it also feels like that we're talking more and more about shared decision making, and that it's giving opportunities for providers, as well as patients to think together about, you know, what is the best course of therapy, um, to your point of the 0.9% or one in a hundred um, that might really benefit as opposed to the side effects. And so it seems that, you know, having this opportunity to, to hear this kind of data that in the advocacy realm and thinking about patient choice and patients being activated, it really, this kind of trial and showing these kind of results opens up that opportunity to really talk about risk, side effects, as well as choice um, for patients, I think for me, more than a lot of other opportunities that we've seen come out of these research design, would you would you say, I mean, how would you comment to really thinking about patient choice and patient activation as it relates to this, the trial findings? Yeah. When, you, when you go to the slide prior to that, um, just to give you the top line, a uh, slide that I skipped, I think, you know, the top line here, conclusion, and it's really along the lines of what you just said, is provides a framework for discussion. And the discussion here is between patient and provider. And I think this enables us to, to individualize the adjuvant treatment. You know, it's not one size fits all. We've known this for a long time, but we didn't have data to support these decision-making processes. Now, providers need to be aware of these data. I mean, when patients ask, so I just heard there is a study that look, talks about shorter duration, what is the trade-off? Then I hope that physicians will be aware of the data and we you can tell you we're going to publish the data very soon uh, so that people not only have a presentation but a real publication at hand. But it, I completely agree, it enables discussions and that I think is the great advantage that we have now compared to pre ASCO when we didn't have this information. Excellent, thank you. So I, but I, again, when you talk about, and I made, I think I made a pretty strong point that for the 60% of patients with the low risk cancers, that three months duration is adequate. And I highlight this again, because the difference here is 0.2%. That means two out of 1,000 patients is, it's a theoretical risk, you know, in which is, we don't know who these patients are. And um, I, 
if I always think about how would I like to be treated, you know, when I when I uh, talk about you know suggesting or recommending treatment to my patients, and if I had a low risk cancer, I would not in the world take anything more than a three months of therapy. It's interesting. Let me let me give you one before we go into this discussion. I have a very you know it's, 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 there's a pain, very interesting patient. We always talk about this violinist, you know, who gets adjuvant therapy and doesn't want neurotoxicity. And he actually had a higher risk of cancer. And he was uh, at the University of Iowa, was actually involved in patient advocacy group, has YouTube videos about how, they, how you can play a violin after oxaplan-based therapy because neurotoxicity is not bad if you stop at three months. So he only wanted three months of treatment. I said, you know, we have a study going that's more like treating you one of the arms. And said, oh, I'm really interested in le learning when the study results are there. So he's now four, five years out, and I, right before ASCO, he came for his last visit, and I showed him the results. And I showed him, okay, you know, you had this higher risk tumor, there was this potential detriment of 1.7%, you know, and we don't know whether we should or should. And he said, I'm so happy I stopped treatment. Because 1.7% for me would never be anything that I would like to continue treatment for, because now I can still play my violin. So these are the discussions we have with patients. And I think this, it goes to individualized treatment because I can see some other patients would say 1.7%, that's a big thing for me. I would like to continue treatment, but that's why we need to engage patients in discussions. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of questions, um, follow-up questions that have come through. And again, to um, the attendees on the line on the right-hand side of your screen, if you have questions, feel free to type them in there. Um, so, Dr. Grothy, we have a, a question um, as it relates, well, let me give you her question here. So, we have a stage three rectal cancer patient who opted out mm -hmm. of post-surgical chemotherapy and is now um, over 10 years cancer-free. Um, the first question is, are there any studies specific for rectal cancer patients? And the second question is, um, do the does the study that you are presenting on today um, did it include any rectal cancer patients or can it be applied to rectal cancer patients? So the one of the studies as part of this group effort, you know, the, the UK study actually did include rectal cancer patients and they showed the same finding for rectal cancer as for colon cancer. So shorter duration, their study actually was uh, equivalent, was not inferior to uh, the uh, longer duration. So the UK study group felt very comfortable only for all patients recommending a shorter duration of therapy, but they do acknowledge that the higher risk patients might trend toward longer duration of therapy. So they, are, they do have rectal cancer patients in the study. Now, as a side note for that, as um, in the United States, um, there was a long time uh, when we tried to run these adjuvant studies separately for colon cancer and for rectal cancer. And it never really worked for the rectal cancer patients because everyone modeled their a treatment approach according to colon cancer, where we already had the data. And I believe that's right. The difference between colon cancer and rectal cancer for this type of treatment is not existent. You know, it's more important to get the radiation component right, have the right surgeon and whatever. So the upfront management is a little bit different. But once patients have, let's say, have the tumor removed, and then the question of what should we do, chemotherapy or no chemotherapy, the decision trees between colon cancer and rectal cancer are very similar. There's more, also from a genetic level, molecular level, uh, colon cancer and rectal cancer are very similar. They're more similar than left and right colon. So left and right colon, as we now know, are very different tumors, um, at least when they have spread and have, have generated metastasis. Between left colon and rectum, there's no difference from a genetic perspective. Thank you. Um, so speaking of um, genetics, we have a question from a survivor who's a, who has Lynch syndrome. Um, are the recommendations for three months for low-risk patients any different for patients that have been diagnosed with Lynch syndrome? So Lynch syndrome is interesting. So first of all, you know, in stage two cancer, which were not the ones that we see here, uh, Lynch patients with Lynch tumors have excellent prognosis they have a 95% disease-free survival of three years. So they normally do not need any treatment. If they are, say, of stage three tumors, meaning lymph node-positive tumors, we normally recommend Folfox. 
um, or KPOX here in this setting, so an oxaplatin based regimen. So in full disclosure, we have not yet done an analysis in these 12,800 patients where we expect about, uh, let's say, 1,000 patients with Lynch syndrome, whether the analysis holds up here or not. I personally do not believe that there should be a difference from a biologic perspective. But I also want to highlight that Lynch syndrome patients with stage 3 they will be soon be candidates for immunotherapy trials, which are being activated in the United States in August, where we use, because these tumors respond to immunotherapy, uh, at least in an advanced in stage four setting. In stage three, there is a, going to be an intergroup study, so a cooperative group study, which gets in, activated um, using a, an immunotherapy agent called atezolizumab, um, and will specifically be around for patients with Lynch syndrome. And I'm very excited about the study because, um, you know, this could be really the first foray of immunotherapy into adjuvant treatment in, with curative potential in patients with colon cancer. Thank you so much. Um, a couple more questions here. Um, for patients that have gone through the six-month adjuvant uh, therapy who have symptoms such as neuropathy, is there anything that can be done to heal the neuropathy or make it more manageable, make it happen less often? You know, that's that's exactly a problem. And I've been involved in the neurotoxicity research for yeah, for two decades now, almost two decades, and there's really not a lot we can do. And that's the problem. That's really the reason why what sparked this study, uh, because we want to prevent it from happening and not having to deal with later. So uh, the neuropathy comes in different shapes and forms, um, and a lot of neuropathy research that comes from other cancers has focused on painful neuropathies, which are not that common with oxaliplatin, but if there are painful neuropathies, there's some data uh, of a, um, a drug called duloxetine, um, or a factor which is an antidepressant, actually, which can reduce the uh, pain sensation for patients. But pain is not necessarily the most common side effect that I see long term. It's more like numbness and tingling. Um, and uh, that is something that is unfortunately, yeah, not treatable. And again, that's why we try to prevent it. Great. Um, so moving on, our, our next questions. Thank you for that, that thorough answer. Um, Oh, excuse me, I lost, I lost it. Okay, so um, as we know, the findings are quite intriguing, and the question is, um, will guidelines for treatment of stage three colon cancer patients um, change to reflect um, the data that you've presented today? And if so, what is the process for that, and what is that timeline? Yeah, so the, the most important guidelines for the United States are the NCCN guidelines. Uh, the, uh, and they affect really, they really are most commonly used. And I'm a member of the NCCN Guidelines Committee, um, and I'm also a member of the European Guidelines Committee and the Japanese Guidelines Committee. And for the NCCN Committee, for instance, um, we have a face-to-face -face meeting at, uh, in Philadelphia at the end of August, We will, uh, where we go through all the guidelines and make sure that they are up-to-date, that ASCO uh, recommendations are integrated. We already discussed that the data here are so important in affecting patients' quality of life uh, that we have to have a, a teleconference before that because we have a mechanism where we can use an, kind of an, a teleconference to discuss a, a pertinent data. And then it really gets changed uh, with an online vote, more or less, and the data are pretty clear and straightforward. So we can target one topic that uh, then gets uh, gets uh, integrated into the guidelines and not this overhaul with, is, uh, with our annual face-to-face -face meeting. So that will happen in the next couple of weeks and hopefully we'll see the implementation shortly afterwards. Um, again, until then, I hope that patients become more aware. We try to uh, really, and ASCO helped of course, and, and you know, fight colorectal cancer helps with, you know, webcasts like this one to create awareness and uh, spark the discussion. And then eventually, of course, we will have a publication out hopefully soon that will then also uh, influence the patient, uh, influence provider decisions and patient decisions on that. So that leads into our, our next question. Um, 
from a patient um, asking what, what to do if their doctor doesn't know about this information. How, how might you recommend that they, they bring it to their attention? Would it just be um, you know, showing them the article once it's published, or is there an alternative way? So uh, there are various ways. First of all, I mean, guidelines should be changed very soon. So that is the easiest way. Secondly, you know, the article once it's published, but that will take weeks to months, you know, just from the whole publication process. The third point would be, I mean, the ASCO presentations are available on the internet. So the slides, actually more comprehensive slides than I showed you, are available. And then there are expert opinions. I mean, the whole um, world is, um, you know, oncology world has access to expert opinions. And I do believe there is a way that this can be transmitted. I can also tell you that I've had several physicians uh, wanting me to call them back, discuss individual patients in terms of duration of therapy, and I'm doing this. I'm doing, I'm, you know, patients who are aware of the data or have made aware of the data by their patients. I'd be more than happy to engage in discussions on an individual basis. I think, you know, there's part of the responsibility when you put these data out there, you need to be able to follow up with that. So I'd be more than happy to put myself in the yeah, position to, to communicate that. That's wonderful. And I know getting the information out there um, is important and is, is starting to happen. So um, we appreciate that. Um, and I think we have we have one final question um, here for the afternoon. Um, the question, it's interesting to hear about a trial that, that was truly looking at reducing toxicity for patients and survivors. Are there any additional studies that you know of um, that are coming down the pipeline that address toxicity um, in a similar way? Not in a similar way. Um, so, I mean, let, let me backtrack. There was a very interesting presentation at ASCO uh, which I think you know you might want to um, uh, get Ethan Bass uh, around this, who was actually a plenary session presentation too, which um, looked at patient interaction with physicians as in a standardized way, and um, and that reduced side effects and actually increased survival for patients with cancer overall. For patients with cancer, very interesting. So there are what I like is that there are more awareness now to run studies which, number one, really target patients' quality of life, the survivorship moment, number two, integrate patients in decision processes. I think this is a great time, um, and it's really kudos to, to you and to your group, you know, uh, providing a platform and the tools for patients to really be able to do that, because it's a complicated thing. Now, so having said that, and coming back to the initial question, you know, the question that we have right now where I see this could also be implemented is duration of some of the immunotherapies. So, you know, immunotherapy is very effective in, in several cancers. And sometimes we see complete responses, cancer completely gone, and we don't know how long we should treat. And that's not trivial because, you know, as patients who have this Lynch syndrome stage 4 colon cancer who have complete response after pembrolizumab, for instance, and they are two years out, and I don't know, should I stop the treatment? Should I continue the treatment? I mean, these treatments can have side effects, all the endocrinological side effects, autoimmune phenomena, and also costs. I mean, this is, when I prescribe the treatment, I am writing, you know, a treatment for several hundred thousand dollars per year. So the question is, is this the setting or it similar setting where we want to generate a duration question. I can tell you that the companies who sell these drugs are not interested in ever answering this question because they make money from that. So it really um, comes back to who would support these studies that just looking at duration question. There are, there are studies out there that try to look at chemo prevention uh, treat, uh, and, and toxicity prevention therapy but unfortunately, those trials have largely been not powered enough. They're not large enough. And the results have not always been very convincing. Um, so bottom line is, I think, you know, this is really a unique study that you see here. And hope it paves the way for future studies showing that these pretty simple questions, which is shorter duration as effective as longer duration with less toxicity, um, that those studies can pave the way for other investigations uh, that can really enhance patients' quality of life across the tumor, uh, tumor entities that we treat. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Grothy. Um, I mean, great perspective, really interesting things to think about and wonderful study, um, in super interesting results. Um, I want to thank you again for taking time out of your day to present um, to fight colorectal cancer and thank you to the attendees for taking time out of your day to join us on this uh, webinar. Um, if any other questions come through, please uh, reach out and thank you again and have a great day, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thanks for thank enabling you. that. Okay, bye-bye.